So we all remember those magical days in elementary school when your teacher was sick or they didn't want to teach anymore and they wheeled out the TV with the VHS player. Those days introduced me to so many animated movies I'd never seen before. That's how I saw stuff like Cars, Shark Tale, and the rest of the Cinderella trilogy for the first time. Now for this, I'm just going to cut to the chase. I've never seen Anastasia before. At least not in full. But this is one of those films I remember seeing in that box of VHS tapes under the TV. Flash forward about 15 years later and I randomly stumble across a poster for Anastasia on my Facebook feed. Don't ask me why I was on Facebook. And I think to myself, hmm, I've never watched this. Two quick fights of existential anxiety later and there I was watching this movie wrapped up in a blanket at half past midnight. So now I want to share with you some of my non-nostalgic analysis of the 1997 film Anastasia. You don't need a guiding star, trust your ticker, get there quicker. <laughs> In 1994, Fox Studios approached Don Bluth and Gary Goldman with the preposition of making an animation studio. Don Bluth and Gary Goldman were both coming from Don Bluth Studios after the less than stellar box office debut of Thumbelina. Both of these now legendary animators got their start working for Disney with Don Bluth splitting off in the late 70s to make his own studio. After doing a bit of digging, it was cool to find that a bunch of movies I had just assumed were Disney movies back in the day were actually movies produced by his studio. The Land Before Time is the one that sticks out to me the most. And if you didn't have a dinosaur phase between the ages of like 2 and 10, then I really don't trust you. So Fox brought them on and gave them the bag. They had a pretty significant investment to create Fox Animation, but we all know that that animation studio had a relatively short run. After contracting Bluth in 1994, there was some back and forth on what their first movie would be, and the story goes Bluth and his team were set on adapting one of the theatrical IPs they already had ownership of. It was Fox executive Bill Mechanic who suggested they adapt Anastasia. Anastasia would debut in theaters on Thanksgiving Day in 1997, but check this. To try and squash Fox Animation's coming out party, Disney brought back their live action George of the Jungle and Hercules film to theaters that same weekend. Now that's some corporate thugging if I've ever seen it. So funny enough, even though Disney had a strong re-release of those two films, Anastasia would still do really well in the box office. Despite this though, the studio would fold less than two years later, in the year 2000, just two weeks after their final film, Tainei. Now if you want to hear more about Tainei, you can check this video in the top right or the link in the description for a pretty well done video on it. What, what, hmm. what are you circling me? What, are, what, were you a vulture in another life? I'm playing Dimitri, who is trying to capitalize on the fact that the uh, Princess Anastasia has been missing. Uh, look, I know it's strange, but I don't remember. I have very few memories of my past. Hmm. They grumble and they argue and they, you know, play a lot, although there's an unspoken attraction there. Tight. Are you trying to tell me that you think that I am Anastasia? All I'm trying to tell you is that I've seen talent. Now, for the movie itself, man, where do I start? This movie feels magical. The idea of a character going from the streets to royalty is a classic trope and it works so well in fairy tales because it evokes that stunning and romantic view of the world. Anastasia gives me a lot of the same vibes that made movies like Cinderella such a classic. The story starts off with the Romanovs having a ball at their palace and this is where we're introduced to Anastasia and her grandmother the Empress Marie. We get a glimpse of their loving relationship as grandma gives Anastasia a music box. All the festivities stop though as soon as Rasputin walks into the ballroom. After being exiled, he sold his soul and returned to the palace to place a curse on the Romanovs. It's actually a pretty chilling scene. The mood shift happens so quickly it really cuts through the air. His name was Rasputin. We thought he was a holy man, but he was a fraud. Now this scene is supposed to be referencing the beginning of the Russian Revolution which led to the persecution of the nobility and brought the end of monarchy in Russia. There is a bit of a disconnect here though with the sorcery being what incites the revolt. But once the revolutionaries started storming the palace, I really liked that sense of panic they focused on. Anastasia is able to escape but she's dropped the music box and along the way she gets separated from her grandmother. And just like that you're rooting for Anastasia. The majority of the film shows Anastasia, now called Anya, attempting to reunite with her grandmother in Paris through a bunch of obstacles. 
And she's being led there with the help of these two con men who are after the reward for finding the Dowager Empress. Oh yeah, and she has amnesia. I'm not sure if this is something that I love across the board, but stories that focus on a quest are ones that bring out a lot of heartwarming feelings in me, so... And it's especially when the quest is to return home or to be reunited with the loved one. Like, I remember how on the edge of my seat I was when I watched the first Rugrats movie. And that was before the internet decided it was mid. There is a cool spin on Anya's motivations though because in her mind she's not taking the journey for the promise of wealth and royalty, she's honestly looking for her family. And this journey is her first steps to gaining that. Here we've got our crew of two con men, Dimitri and Vlad, and our likable main character with an attitude, and a dog. They might start off as strangers, but they become her family over the course of the film. Telling me what? What were you a vulture in another life? I'm I'm sorry, Anya. It's, it's Anya. Anya. It's Anya. Just, it's just that you look an awful lot like. <laughs> they have a kind of romantic comedy banter, a rhythm of talking. That, that I like it. I've never really seen in an animated movie before. Do you really think I'm royalty? You know I do. Then stop bossing me around. <laughs> Most of the character work is focused on Dimitri and Anya and it's probably the best part of this movie. The way they talk to each other is filled with so much wit and charisma and they get this across with both the animation and the dialogue. That's why the scenes that play out in the train make up my favorite stretch of events. It starts off with Dimitri and Vlad sneaking Anastasia on the train because she doesn't have any ID or travel documents because, you know, she's supposed to be dead. And the way they animate these scenes of Dimitri and Anya going back and forth do a good job at characterizing them but also building great romantic tension. Please, don't talk anymore, okay? It's only gonna upset me. Fine, I'll be quiet. I'll be quiet if you will. Alright, I'll be quiet. Fine. 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 They're both stubborn and childish but there's a sense of longing in both of them. There's a natural pace in how they speak and respond to each other, and I love the unevenness of the line deliveries. Even the body language and facial expressions are so on point, it's electric. You think you're gonna miss it? Miss what? You're talking? No. Russia. Nope. Is it with you and Holmes? Well, for one thing, it's something that every normal person wants. And for another thing, it's a thing where you- What? You know- Oh, forget it! Fine. <sighs> I could watch that scene a million times over. When Dimitri scoffs at Anya's obsession of finding her home, you can feel that he doesn't know where he belongs. He's shut his heart and chosen to just follow the opportunity he has at hand, while Anya is hoping to find the love and support of her true family. I don't know man, but I think this is the best romance I've seen in an animated project, maybe ever? I'm definitely not an authority on that, but this was really good. On the flip side, you get Rumpelstiltskin's demon minion sabotaging the train cars in an attempt to kill Anya. I like this scene because despite how they were bickering before, Anya and Dimitri both have a lot of courage and bravery in the face of a life threatening situation. Like I am sure my first instincts would not be to run towards the train car that's on fire, but I can fairly say that I don't have that main character energy. Now the way that the train escalates in itself is a little wild because it begins with the train attendants checking passenger tickets and documents or whatever which is pretty menacing in itself, but then the demons interfere and it just keeps going from worse to worser. And I'm just not sure why there's dynamite in the luggage car, but man, that whole scene had me on the edge of my seat. Just before this scene is where we're reintroduced to Rasputin again and we find out that he's undead because the curse that he put on the Romanovs hasn't been fulfilled. I know that this was aiming to compete with Disney so it makes sense, it's a part of the formula right? You have an antagonist in the mold of Scar, Jafar or Ursula but I don't know, I felt like the idea of Anastasia having to find her way back home was engaging enough without adding a lot of this evil wizard dialogue. There seems to be a crowd of people online who just don't like this portrayal of rescuing and I think that ties into that crowd that criticizes the film for being historically inaccurate. But as a member of the smooth brain community, that wasn't my issue at all really. I just wonder how much better this movie would have been if Rasputin was just flat out dead and Anya had to find a way to break his curse anyways. 
Like, I like the magic elements themselves, but some of the points where the magic came about clashed with the very real suspense of revolutionaries or drowning in a storm. The only thing that's kind of keeping me on the fence from removing Rasputin entirely is Bartok. He's funny, man. I'm definitely noticing a trend with me, but with these campy voice roles, I find myself repeating every line. And I did enjoy their relationship to a degree. It's like Bartok is a friend trying to keep his homie from fighting at the function, but the homie's mad because nobody likes him. Yeah, I, I rock with Bartok. Actually, considering how long you've been dead, you look pretty good. <laughs> Uh, sir, is this the face of a bat who would lie to you? Take it easy there. Really, you should watch your blood pressure. My nephew Izzy just keeled over one day mid-mango. Stress, it's a killer, sir. And he's a fruit bat. No meat. No bloody. So here's where I gush a little bit. The art of the film is a combination of digital painted cells, hand painted backgrounds, and 3D animation. The most outstanding feature of this film for me was in its dimensionality and its cinematography. There is a really nice sense of depth that I've never seen before in an animated film. That is in part due to the use of really wide shots and clear leading lines to create that perspective and it's also in part due to the use of diminution or the shortening of elements as they move in perspective. And they use that in scenes where you have characters overlapping with each other in the foreground and background of the setting. But I think the biggest part of that three dimensional feeling is with the CG graphed elements and 3D effects which allow them to move the point of view as if it were a real camera. Another great use of digital animation was deployed in those really great wide shots, right? I watched the making of Anastasia documentary and they made it a point to note how much they were able to do by animating a handful of characters and duplicating that several times over to create these really dynamic and large scale choreographed scenes. They put this use really well in the Have You Heard song towards the beginning of the film. The song shows the people of St. Petersburg and how even though they've fallen on tough times economically, they make it through the day by gossiping and sharing secrets. And most of the gossip is relating to their hope of Anastasia being alive and that the Romanovs would return to power. It's a scene with a lot of great use of diminution and perspective as well and it's one of my favorite moments in the film just going off of visuals alone. Now, this is 1997, so a lot of the 3D models looked kinda wonky, and they definitely look out of place. Like the first one that comes to mind is the music box, but even for things like that, it just gives me that sense of mixed animation that shows like the amazing world of Gumball gets praised for now. I'm sure it was a lot more uncomfortable for people who grew up with this movie or saw this movie a lot earlier in their life, but I don't know, it fit for me. They also did the camera view movement a wild amount of times, like there's one scene near the beginning that has no purpose other than to be like, hey, look at this. After the runaway train incident and continuing the trip by foot, the crew end up taking a boat into France. On the boat, there's a slight wobble to the frame to help simulate the feeling of motion, and I already thought that that was cool. In the next scene, there is a storm that comes while they sail overnight. And now the way that they simulated the rocking of the boat during the storm was even cooler to me. I just love the sway of the rooms and how that would change the way the characters move throughout the boat. Like the actual swaying of the ship changed the way that they had to animate each character. While the storm is happening, Rasputin sends even more demon things to try and kill Anya once again. These demon fairies put a spell on Anya while she's sleeping that leads her to sleepwalk out onto the deck and attempt to throw herself overboard. The way the fairies convince her is by conjuring up dreams of her walking through a beautiful woodland area while hearing and seeing members of her royal family. I didn't catch it until the second watch but the person convincing her to jump off the boat is actually a mirage of her father. Dimitri ends up saving her and they share a pretty emotional scene but, but I was still marveling at the way that they were moving throughout the ship. Once they get to France, the story switches from the scenic adventure into a more direct story. Initially, Vlad and Dimitri hope to present Anya to the Empress through her assistant slash cousin Sophie. For them, the plan hasn't changed, but we get a glimpse into what the Empress has been dealing with in her search for her granddaughter. For every Anastasia impersonator, Marie has to relive the heartbreak of losing her in the first place. At this point, she's decided to give up on her search, and I get where she's coming from. By all accounts, she's been a very kind, family-oriented woman and to have to deal with people trying to take advantage of her grief has to get old eventually. 
Ignorant to this, Dimitri and Vlad, with the help of Sophie, hope to reintroduce the two by going to the same theater and meeting after Marie watches the play. Another find I realized during my second watch was that the play that they were watching was actually Cinderella. I thought that that was a very beautiful and fitting analogy to the story because it's essentially a similar storyline. It's actually a really touching moment to see Anya dressed to the tens, about to be reintroduced with her royal family, watching this rags to riches story right in front of her. It's essentially preparing herself for the magical change that she is about to experience. I also thought it worked very very well as great foreshadowing for what's about to happen. The clock's about to strike 12 for Anya. In the next scene, Dimitri and Vlad attempt to introduce the two. Once Sophie lets Dimitri into the private balcony Marie viewed the play from, he tries to turn it on. From this point, he thinks he can play to her desire to meet her granddaughter again, but little did he know Marie's heart had closed. I like this scene because it cashes in on the conflict within Dimitri. He had also made his mind up and gave up on his hopes for the old Russia and hopes for himself as well as the old Romanovs. This was a job for him, and a way to get his hands on money that could change his life forever. Through the journey of the film, he began to really believe in Anya's legitimacy as the Dowager Empress, and now he stands before Marie and he's having his shady past thrown back in his face. He's inches away from doing the right thing for his friend and for his country, but it's not coming to fruition. The scene ends up with Marie's guards throwing him out, but not before revealing to an eavesdropping Anya that Dimitri is a known conman who's just after the reward. And just like that, everything falls apart. When watching this, I had a feeling that this wouldn't go well the first time around, but I was kind of surprised with the series of events they went with. In this scene, the expressions were great, and it's especially apparent once he gets kicked out into the hole and has to explain to Anya. You can really feel the guilt and the desperation on Dimitri's face, and then you can feel the frustration and the apathy in Marie. You can feel the hurt and pain in Anya. I've said it before, but the conversations between these two are amazingly animated, and this one is no different. The back and forth sway across the scene really adds to the tension and angst. You lied! And I not only believed you, I actually- oh! After Anya slaps Dimitri and walks off, I didn't know what would happen. Dimitri's last stand is crazy, but compelling. He hijacks the Empress's car and forces her to see the music box he got from the very beginning of the movie when the revolutionaries attack the palace. Whew. With that, he convinces her to at least meet Anya and thus reunites the Romanov family. Seeing Anya and her grandmother together it was more heartwarming than I anticipated, but I think it's because it feels really earned. A decade or so of confusion and longing made them both go through a lot of emotional stress. I'm glad they've got to have their moment together and I'm also glad the story doesn't quite end there. And no, I'm not talking about Rasputin's final appearance. It was cool to see Dimitri save her one last time, I guess, but man, the more Rasputin pops up, the more annoyed I am with this character, so I'm gonna just skip right over that. They put a much appreciated bow on top by ending the film with Anya and Dimitri running off together. Usually, I'd feel like it's a forced ending to have the two main characters run off and be in love forever when all they did was say two words to each other type, but, but this was more than that. And in that, it feels earned. Anastasia is one of the most romantic and expressive movies I've seen in a long time. The story is full of hope and adventure as well as celebrating family bonds. It's crazy to me that I could watch a movie like this and be so engrossed that I watched it like three times in a row. And it's not a movie from my childhood. At least not one that I remember. It's amazing to see something that uses such an interesting blend of like the old standards of animation with the newer tools and methods available at the time. Obviously not everyone's gonna love the rotoscoping or the 3D models, but to me this is an animation style and ethos I'd love to see again. Let me know what you guys think about this one in the comments and I'll see you guys in the next one.